Well, first of all, thank you everybody for coming, and, and thank everyone who's read the book. Thank you for reading it, and those of you who haven't yet, I hope to convince you to read it, and thank you in advance, um, and thank you to the World Affairs Council for having me. Um, what kind of writer am I? You know, when I was younger, I like overthought that, and I think as I've gotten older, I try to think. I try to worry less about that and what kind of labels get mm -hmm. put on me. You know, I just I wanted to write novels. I wanted to write fiction, and for lack of a better phrase, what they call literary fiction, mm -hmm. which is supposedly the genreless fiction. Is the mic good? Sorry, I should have checked, but a little, a little louder. Okay. Um, I just thought I, wa I want to write novels, just fiction, like not a particular genre, just whatever I want to do. And my first three books were all very different from each other. Uh, the first one was historical fiction set in the Pacific Northwest during the 1918 flu epidemic. The second one was uh, about bank robbers during the Great Depression, but with a lot of magical realism in it. I was kind of playing with the idea of mythology, uh, a lot of the myths around people like John Dillinger and Bonnie and Clyde, and I kicked it up a notch by having two uh, bank robbing brothers who discover that they, uh, they can be killed, but every day after they're killed, they wake up again. Um, and my third novel, uh, had a time traveler in it. So I've sort of dabbled in different genres here and there. Uh, and I, I've also moved a lot. My wife and I have moved, I've lived in a lot of different places. So my first three books were all set in different parts of the country. Um, and then we moved here 10 years ago. It's been 10 years as of last month. Uh, I remember we were packing up our boxes in Washington, DC, listening to Sarah Palin give her acceptance speech on NPR. <laughs> And then about a week later, we took our time visiting friends on the way south. And we were unpacking our boxes in our new expensive, or very frighteningly expensive at the time, house. Uh, and then we heard that Lehman Brothers had just collapsed and the entire financial industry was falling apart. Uh, so we were a little terrified we'd made a horrible mistake. But anyway, <laughs> those are the two sort of historical events that kind of bookended our move. Um, and my wife and I, we, we had lived a lot of different places at that time in our lives. Um, you know, following educational opportunities, following jobs. And we had lived in DC for a while, didn't love it. We spent a lot of time deciding where are we gonna move next? And we are very type A, very anal retentive. We had like lists of pros and cons for, for places like Asheville and Atlanta and, and other cities. And one thing I never thought about until I lived here, I moved here and then maybe a month or so into my stay, um, I was at, I think, Acapella Books great bookstore in Little Five Points. And you know, I was checking out the cool indie bookstores. And I noticed they had a shelf that said Southern literature or Southern writers. And I thought, oh, that's right. There's this thing called Southern literature or a type of writer, a Southern writer. I'm like, I don't think I'm a Southern writer because I just got here. And none of, my, <laughs> none of my novels have been set in the South. I mean, Washington State, Ohio, and Washington, DC. Um, you know, my books aren't going to be on that shelf. And I had this sudden you know, moment of clarity that, you know, again, my wife and I, we had thought about schools and cost of living and proximity to mountains and beaches and everything you could imagine we were trying to decide where to live. I never once thought about what it would mean for me as a writer. I felt, I'm a novelist. I can live wherever I want. It doesn't matter. Uh, well, you know, we're pretty particular in the South. Yeah, I've, I've been learning. I've been learning. So it, it was a really kind of interesting aha moment. Uh -huh. um, and at that time in my life, you know, I wanted to write a book where I lived. Because, again, my first three books, not only were they all in different places, but they were all set in places that I wasn't living when I wrote them, mm -hmm. um, which is really hard. Because you have to remember, all right, what does the sunlight look like? What kind of trees do they have? And, you know, I, as I got older, I started to see the value in kind of having a beat or having a field and having something that I would know really, really well. And it would be nice to not have to reinvent the wheel with every book, but it would be nice to be able to walk outside and see the way the light is hitting something and think, oh, I can put that in the book, or, or the way people talk, or just the day-to-day -day observations you have about the world. So I've been thinking you know, in the back of my mind, it sure would be nice to write a book set in Atlanta. And then I learned the story of Atlanta's first black cops, and that got my Where did you turned. learn that from? Where did I learn it from? Mm -hmm. So being a relative newcomer, I asked a bunch of friends, what are some great books on Atlanta history? And I know a lot of journalists, and journalists are often relocated, like a lot of magazines and newspapers think it's good to not have a reporter live in the same city too long, because they get to know it too well, and they, they don't see stories the same way. So I had a bunch of friends who were also newcomers and writers, so had had to quickly learn about Atlanta. And one book they all kept mentioning was um, Where Peace Tree Meets Sweet Auburn by Gary Pomerantz, who was a former AJC reporter. 
And it's a great book. I highly recommend it. It follows two families, uh, one African American and one white, through about 150 years of Atlanta history. It starts before the Civil War and goes up to the Olympics. Let's take a little survey. How many know about that book? Oh, that's Pretty good. surprising. Yeah, I thought Everham would go up. Yeah. Well, they become very mm -hmm. politically prominent families yeah. because the black family leads up to Maynard Jackson, the city's first black mayor in the 70s. The white family leads up to Ivan Allen, who was mayor during the civil rights movement and is credited for being one of the most progressive mayors in the South at that time. Um, but smack in the middle of this, I don't know, 700 page book, mm -hmm. there's a four or five page passage about uh, the circumstances surrounding the hiring of the city's first black police officers. There were eight of them. Uh, in 1948, and then the politics behind why it happened then was interesting, but what really grabbed me was he mentioned that they could only patrol white neighborhoods, and they could not drive squad cars, there was a, a law on the books, either a city law or a state law, that African Americans could not drive government-owned vehicles, they couldn't use headquarters, uh, the police chief and the mayor were afraid that, well, a Newsweek article one year earlier, 1947, estimated that as many as a third or maybe a quarter of white cops in Atlanta were members of the Ku Klux Klan. So the police chief and the mayor were worried that if these eight black men who dared wear the same uniform as the white cops, the white cops would be so outraged they would riot and attack them. And Atlanta would have its second race riot originate in its own police station. So for their protection, they uh, couldn't use headquarters. They instead got to operate, open their own precinct in the basement of the Butler Street YMCA, which it's that way. down the street yeah. around the corner. So that was their precinct, the, the basement of a Y. Um, and they could only work the night shift from, I think it was 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. And last but not least, they could not arrest white people. If, God forbid, they should see a white person committing a crime, they were supposed to call in the white cops to assist in the arrest. But of course, the idea back then was, well, they're only patrolling the black neighborhoods, right? And this is a time of strict segregation, and everybody keeps to themselves. So they're not even going to see any white people, let alone any white people breaking the laws, right? right. But you know, as a novelist, you're always thinking, well, well yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now, this is an interesting moment, because I don't know whether you noticed or not, but you just told a black story, and you're not. So how did you decide sure. that this was something that you should write about? Well, I thought about that a lot. Uh -huh. And I think I should say, I mean, it's a black story in that sense, yes. But at mm -hmm. the same time, I wanted there to be white characters as well. So mm -hmm. the story follows two black partners and two white partners who the black officers suspect of having committed a murder. Because I, I thought it would be best if the story was told with that kind of panoramic perspective. And, that this is not just an issue that applies to African Americans. This is really about the city, it's about the South, and it's about America. So I wanted both sides of the story told. However, the true heroes are, are, are the black rookie cops who did so much and paved the way. So yeah, I wondered, you know, can, can I tell this story? And I, I don't think I would have written it if it had been my first novel, if I'd never written fiction before. But I've always written books about characters that were pretty different from myself. I think there's different types of novelists. There's some writers who always write books that are kind of about themselves, or they're you know, very autobiographical fiction. And even now, there's this trend toward what they call autofiction, which is extremely, it's, it's, it's barely even fiction at all. It's, it's very much about the writer. And it's, in my opinion, a little narcissistic, but it's, it's a different type of writing. Um, and certainly you see with a lot of first novels, uh, a lot of first novels are very autobiographical because somebody, they're in their 20s, they haven't lived a lot, and what do they know? They know themselves. That's why there's a lot of books out there about uh, young white people graduating from uh, writing school and moving to Brooklyn and then wanting to be writers because that's what those writers do. <laughs> I mean, seriously, there's, there's an epidemic of books about writers and books about college professors. No offense, lots of books about college professors. Um, because a lot of writers teach. Because um, it's, a, it's a good way to financially survive if you're trying to write fiction. Um, I've never done that. You know, my first novel was set in the 1918 flu epidemic about Eastern European immigrants living in Washington State. My previous novel, The Revisionist, the one that was set in DC after 9-11, that had four main characters, one of whom was white. Uh, the other three were not. Because I lived in DC for six years, and it always perplexed me that of living in a majority black city was often you know, the only white person on a bus or a subway. 
And then I'd turn on the TV and watch a movie or a TV show set in Washington, D.C., and everybody was white. And I'd think, oh, what, what Washington, D.C. is this? Because this is not the town I live in. It always bothered me. So when I wrote my Washington novel, I wanted to make sure I had a very diverse cast, a cast that, in my opinion, reflects Washington today. So, so it sounds like you did something of an apprenticeship in thinking about what D.C. was like. Yeah, I mean, I thought D.C. is a really interesting place. Mm -hmm. I moved there in 02, and you still felt the, you know, after effect of the riots of 1968, there were still parts of town that had not recovered. Um, so I've, I've thought about that a lot. But, but with this book, yeah, I don't think I would have tried it. It was my first novel. I think having written fiction before and having a better understanding for how to build characters and what makes something work. Um, and, you know, I knew it would be a challenge, but, you know, at the same time, Writing some of these white characters was every bit as hard because mm -hmm. trying to figure out what was a moderately progressive white Southern in 1948 like was pretty difficult too. And so I worked very hard to get the characters right from doing a lot of historical research and finding old memoirs and autobiographies and things like that to try to build the story and make all the characters you know, as nuanced and, and three-dimensional as I could. So beyond apprenticeship, it sounds like you do a good bit of research. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I think even if you're writing a book set now, again, unless you're writing about yourself, unless you're writing about a writer, you have to do a lot of research. If you're writing a book about a stockbroker, you need to know what you're talking about because the stockbroker reads your book. This is not right. And if you're writing a book about cops, you need to know a little bit about how that works. So there's always a lot of research. Um, and it can be intimidating at first, but again, having done it a few times, it made it a little bit easier. But yeah, I, I, I read a lot, and I jot notes down in a notebook, and I go over it again, and I underline, and I flag. and one of the reasons I wanted to write a series is because the more research I did for this book, you know, the more stories and notes and ideas I was having, sometimes for things that were happening then and sometimes for things that were happening later. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that interests me about 1948 is that it's, you know, it's right before so much is going to happen. And the characters don't realize it, but the reader hopefully does. You know, their world is about to undergo so much change. And so I've been gathering a lot of ideas for hopefully future books. So in Dark Town, Dark Town, you do capture that moment. It is that special moment after World War II, before the, the Civil Rights Movement. But you also manage in this book, as you hinted at, to capture uh, some pretty distinctive characters, mm -hmm. you know, uh, across the spectrum of who was occupying that moment at a particular time. I didn't do You're that. back. Yeah, I'm back. Occupying the moment at a particular time. I was always curious, do you have um, a preference for any of those characters, or are you, like, you, you love all of your children, so to speak? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't all love everybody in this book, that's for sure. Uh -huh. But, um, you know, so the two main characters, Lucius Boggs and Tommy mm -hmm. Smith, I'm more like Lucius Boggs. He's, he's bookish. He's a Morehouse man. He's the son of a preacher. He, you know, other people would call him a goody two shoes. I kind of am too. Um, I'm also kind of bookish. And he joins the force with, without really a clear understanding of what he's getting himself into. I think in another life, he would have been a college professor if more of those avenues were open to him in 1948. And like me, I can't imagine being a cop myself. So I like Lucius more. But I, I do love all of them. I mean, I love Tom A. Smith. He's very confident and street smart. He's not as educated as Boggs, but he's very sure of himself. And he's had to navigate a rougher road than, than his more privileged partner has. So I do like them all. And, and you know, what you were saying about the characters, and I'm, I'm glad they came off that way to you, and I appreciate the compliments. But you know, when I'm doing my research, I'm trying to find fault lines and things that divide people, not just black and white, but the, what were the different issues within the white community and the black community. And sometimes it's a matter of finding out about different jobs or di different debates going on at that time that you might I might not have known before. And I'll like, oh, that's good. I want So one random example. Uh, there's a scene late in the book when Lucius Boggs is at a party, his parents host, and one of the guests is his uncle, um, Uncle Percy, um, who's loosely modeled after a, a real author named Frank Yerby, who was, at the time, he was the best-selling black writer in America, but a lot of people didn't know he was black because he wrote stories, he wrote these sort of historical adventure stories, kind of like Last of Mo the Mohican-ish, but usually about white characters. And in fact, a lot of black critics felt that he, his work did not reflect well on the black community. 
Um, and so he, and when I read about him, I was like, God, oh, that's really fascinating. I didn't, I had not known about Frank Derby before. And I, I sort of took aspects of his career and personality and to create this character who's only in, in one chapter, but he's important because he gives Boggs some important advice at the right time. He's almost self-loathing because he's successful, but he worries that maybe he is uh, writing stereotypical books. And he also hates the South. He lives in France. He's an expat. A lot of African-American intellectuals then did leave the country, understandably. And he comes back once a year, so does he family. And he's like, I hate this place. I hate the South. And he always gets really, really drunk and sometimes suicidal. So that's an example. Like, I never would have been able to create that character had I not done a lot of research and stumbled mm -hmm. upon the life story of Frank Irby. But the, the distinctions that you were talking about a minute ago across class just come in very vibrantly as well. So I think it's that um, uh, distinctive quirkiness about the people who occupy the world that you have created that's very fascinating. But the class issue, it's, it's racialized certainly as a volume, but it is also uh, um, quite vibrant in terms of um, clarifying what the stratifications economically across both communities was like. Sure. And so um, how did you capture that piece? Um, yeah, I'm always very interested in class divisions. It's something I've written about a little. I try to write about it more, but sometimes it's hard to make it work in fiction, quite mm -hmm. honestly, or make it work in a way that I think publishers will want to publish. Uh, and that's another debate that goes on in the publishing industry is, why don't we have more working class fiction? Why don't we have more fiction about class? I think most of the fiction that is written about class is actually crime fiction. Um, I think a lot of crime writers do a much better job elucidating a lot of these class issues than, again, your sort of standard literary author who got an MFA and now teaches and maybe is a little divorced from some of these concerns. Whereas, and I'm totally talking in generalizations here, but crime fiction, you're writing often about cops and repo men and prostitutes and hustlers. And, but then at some point, they're going to have to interview the senator or you know, the wealthy heiress. And you get this great um, yeah, like the stratification of class that sometimes it's hard to do in another type of a story. But in a murder investigation, when you need to talk to all these different people, it gives you that um, excuse, basically, to write different scenes with different sorts of people. Um, and so I wanted the two partnerships to have class divides. Again, Boggs, a college grad, you know, was, was raised to think that he was a future leader of his people by his father. His partner is not a college grad and kind of resents it. And you know, on the one hand, he's glad that his, that his partner's family is successful, but he also kind of wishes it was him. And then of the two white cops, Rakestraw, the younger one, went to college for a couple years before interrupting his studies for World War II, and, and he never graduated. But he still gets called college boy by all the white cops, because the vast majority of white cops back then were not college graduates. In fact, I think in, in real life, six of the eight black rookies in 1948 were college grads. Mm -hmm. And that's a graduation rate that like, dwarfed the white cops. Um, again, they had to be twice as good in order to get in. Um, so I wanted to have those tensions there. And also just, you know, class is tied into politics a lot. Mm -hmm. And in Atlanta at that time, you know, Mayor Hartsfeld felt that he could build this coalition with, you know, you know African-American voters and, you know, wealthier whites who weren't as threatened by the fact that the black community in Atlanta was growing. And, you know, he would talk to black leaders and, and say, like, we, we can work together. We got to, you know, keep the Peckerwoods out of it. But, like, between you and these, you know, upper class whites, we, we can build a coalition. And that's a class stratification that we still see today mm -hmm. in our politics. Mm -hmm. So when you um, look at that uh, racialized environment, racist environment, the, the class divides across both communities, because both communities had their own stratification systems. There's also that ideological divide that you're talking about. But there was one little piece in there that I want to pull out before we talk about the Klan. Okay. Okay. So the little piece that I want to pull out is the immigrant piece because it ties, in my view, to why Rick Straw was as he was. Sure. Yeah, so can you talk about why you created that background for him? Sure, so Rick Straw is one of the two white cops. And 
uh, there's the two main characters on the white side are Rakestraw and Dunlow. And Dunlow is pretty much a, racist, a violent racist bigot. He's a bully, he's a thug, and he's always uh, used the black community for his personal enrichment. He takes bribes and kickbacks from the, the moonshiners and, and the brothel madams and that sort of thing. So he's threatened by the new black officers because he's going to lose his meal ticket. He, he doesn't take kindly to the fact that the mayor's telling him, oh, you don't have to patrol the black neighborhoods anymore. We have black cops for that. Or they wouldn't have said black back then. We have, we have Negro officers. You don't need to be there. He wants to be there because that's where he gets all of his, his money. Um, and then his partner, Rakestra, is in his mid-20s. He fought in World War II. And yet when I was building his backstory, I decided he should have a, a German immigrant mother. So his mother you know, came over right around World War I, and she herself experienced discrimination because during World War I, there was a lot of anti-German sentiment, and she was bullied and teased for it. So as a result, she's brought up her kids you know, to, to not talk that way and not think that way. And so racial epithets were never allowed in his house. I, I wanted Rakestraw to be more, more progressive than most white people of that time. I didn't want to make him too progressive. I didn't want to make him feel like he was torn out of 2016, because historical fiction can get that wrong a lot, especially when you're writing about race and gender, because you know, if the writer wants the reader to like this character, and then the character uses a racial epithet or does something really misogynist, the reader is probably going to be like, I don't like this character anymore. And I've had that, like reading Hemingway. You're like, oh, this is a really likable character. And then he says, like, oh, that's right. This is 1925, and he's a white guy. And it, it, it changes your impression of the book. And Hemingway was writing then, but I'm writing now. So that's why I think a lot of writers sometimes fall into the trap of making some of their white male characters unusually progressive about race or unusually open-minded about women. Um, and I didn't want to do that. So I, I wanted him to be more progressive than his partner, and I wanted him to you know, be willing to stir the pot and you know, toe the line here and there, but I didn't want to go too far. And so one, I thought, you know, motivation of his may be that he was brought up by a mother who herself was teased for being different, and so he sort of internalized that in a way. And then because he's brought up uh, bilingual, speaking English and German, he's an advanced scout uh, in Germany. I kind of combined the histories of one of my grandfathers and one of my wife's grandfathers. Uh, her grandfather spoke German and was an advanced scout in World War II. And then as a result of that, Rakestraw, and this is taken from my grandfather's story, uh, gets to, after the hostilities end, he arranges tours of the concentration camps for the German citizens. Uh, the Allies did that sort of as a way of showing uh, German citizens, look, this is why we're occupying your country now. This is why we're right. You guys were doing this, regardless of whether you claim you're OK with it. He was sort of a tour guide of you know, Buchenwald and Dachau. So having seen that and seen the horrors of the Holocaust, it's all the more reason why he wants the South to improve. Like, and there's a, a chapter early in the book where he's talking to some other white cops who do not agree with him. And he's saying, you know, it could be better. You know, he doesn't want the South to turn into the next Nazi Germany. But at the same time, he still can't imagine desegregation. And so he says, you know, there can be a better kind of segregation. And you know, we can treat African American, well, he would have said, we can treat Negroes better than we do now. You know, we can, we can better fund their schools. And we, don't, we should pass anti-lynching laws, both of which were relatively you know, risky things for a white person to say back then. So he, he's willing to go to a certain extent, but he still can't imagine his kids going to school with black kids or living in the same neighborhood, and you know, which is why you know, in the mid 50s, a lot of white supposed progressives took a step back when the Supreme Court said, hey, "All right, desegregate the schools." I'm like, "Well, wait, wait, wait! I didn't, I didn't want to go that far." So I was trying to kind of lay the foundation for that with his character. Mm -hmm. And so, what do you do with women in the book? Not as much as I wish I did, to be completely honest, um, because I have four main characters; they're all cops. There were, there were no female cops at that time. And so it was a challenge. I wanted to have more female characters than I did. My single biggest you know, self-criticism of the book is that it's very male. The second book, less so. Earlier in the book, in earlier drafts, there were more, some of their uh, family members were more richly drawn, and there were some scenes that got cut, uh, which I felt bad about, but I understood why. So um, you know, there are female characters in the book, but they aren't as integral to the plot as I wish they were. But I think that was one of the challenges, too, of, of writing about that time period, is that I mean, not only were the races segregated, but the genders had very different tasks. And it was difficult to always have plot-based reasons to bring them together. So I, I wish there were more women in the book. Um, one of them is, is a brothel madam, which again, I didn't, wa I didn't want her to get stereotypical, so I tried to make her unusual. But as I wrote the book, I was like, gosh, I can see why 
you so often see that really annoying character in, in TV and film and books of the suffering wife of the cop who complains, oh, honey, you're always out late. And it's always such a boring, flat character. And I didn't want to go there. So as a result, I, I didn't go there. Yeah. Well, there's a brothel, um, madam, but there's the victim. Yeah, the, the victim is female. And earlier on, I intended to write more chapters from her perspective, sort of flashbacks that would uh, trace her story and interweave it with the other story. And for various reasons, it wasn't working. The, the idea of having two separate timelines and interweaving them together and not giving away certain things at the wrong time. So I did work on that and ultimately left it out. So she is mm -hmm. the mystery at the heart of the book. Yeah. And we learn a lot about her, but we never get to hear her voice. She remains a mysterious woman. Yes. Now, the clan. OK. What in the world would you want to say about the way that you treat the clan in this novel? I'm trying to remember, because the clan is much more in the second book than mm -hmm. the first book. Um, but it's the uh, shaping of the foundation for who the police are. Yeah, well, yeah. well again, there was that Newsweek story that said that like a third of cops were also Klansmen. So you know, mm -hmm. they took off one uniform and would put on another. So the two went hand in hand. And cases that could not be solved legally would be solved non-legally. Um, and that right before 1948, um, during the Arnall administration, which is a, he was a one-term governor, but he was a reformist governor, and he had a big crackdown on the Klan. And so some of the characters in this book, more so the second, are very disgruntled and embittered because they feel that the Klan was unjustly cracked down on, and they want to sort of bring back the Klan in all its glory. They were discriminated exactly. against. Exactly. It, it, it was a mm -hmm. tough time to be a Klansman. Um, <laughs> and, and it would come back again in, in the 50s and 60s. Like uh -huh. the 20s was sort of the second coming of the clan or the, the tens and twenties. Mm -hmm. And then you know, we would have the third coming uh, as you know, direct result, backlash to the civil rights movement. So it was relatively quiet at the time of this book, but it's certainly still there. Mm -hmm. And you know, an organization like that derives a lot of its power just from being in the shadows and being somewhat mysterious. But you know, as an example of how it worked, so Herbert Jenkins was the mayor of, a, I'm sorry, was the police chief mm -hmm. um, in 1948 and, and I think through the late 60s or even the 70s. He for a was long time. For a very, very long time. And he, he gets a lot of credit for you know, having done a lot of things right where it comes to race. I'm sure he was not perfect. Um, it wouldn't have been what anyone would consider a progressive on race in 2018. But, but he is spoken of very well by a lot of people, including some of the original black cops in Atlanta. But when he was younger, he joined the Klan. And he explained in his memoir that it had been explained to him that it was it was like joining the Elks Club or the Masons. So like it was a box you had to check if you wanted to get promoted. That if you didn't join the Klan, then when time came for promotions, it'd be like, oh, he's, on, he's a member, he's not, he's out. And that's what Rakestra is told, either in this book or the mm -hmm. second, I can't remember which. In both, actually. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, you know, to, to liken themselves Masons or Elks, but at the same time being Klansmen, I mean, it's, it's weird to wrap our heads around, but it did, you know, I mean, in the 20s, it was almost a political party in some states. I know in Indiana, especially, they ran candidates for mayor and governor. So it's, it's always existed in these multiple worlds. Well, I'm going to take a little time out for one thing to, to whet your appetite for the second book. One of my favorite scenes in the second book is when Rake Straw asks his, um, his brother-in-law whether his name was in his hood. And that will be significant when you read the book. Yeah, whether his name is in his hood. And there was going to be more about the Klan and the Colombians, who were a neo-Nazi group in Atlanta uh -huh. at that time, in Darktown originally. And I was is, that, is that true? The Colombians were real, yeah. They were a neo-Nazi group. They wore brown shirts, and they had uh, double lightning bolts, like the SS symbol which is where the title Lightning Man comes from. Um, and they made it a point, especially in the late 40s, but they, were, they might have come back in the early 50s, to, among other things, show up in neighborhoods where you know, a black family had bought a house in a previously all-white neighborhood. And they would show up in force to intimidate them. And they had quasi-military drills and public parks and things like that. It was never a huge group. And you know, 
later people would kind of laugh about them, like, oh, they're like the clan flunkies, and they were mostly young. But you know, it's easy to laugh about them. It's easy to laugh about some people today, but that doesn't mean they still can't be violent and do terrible mm -hmm. things. So they really existed. And initially, they were going to be in Darktown. But again, as I was doing the research and getting more and more ideas, I started to worry that Darktown was going to be this 800-page mm -hmm. doorstop of a book, and I didn't want that to happen. So. Uh, there were certain scenes with Rakestraw's Klansman brother-in-law that I decided to move to the second book. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you that this uh, dark town is really perfectly shaped to prepare you for Lightning Man. Thanks. Group You're two. a great salesman. Yeah. I really appreciate it. <laughs> so, uh, two last questions and then we'll open it up. I imagine that you've talked about dark town a lot. Is there anything that you want to say about Dark Town that we haven't talked about so far? Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, what's the second question? <laughs> <laughs> I'll think in the back of my head. Yeah. The second question is related to my first question. How long have you been in Atlanta now? Ten years last month. Are you beginning to think of yourself as a Southern writer? I'm always afraid to answer that question. Uh -huh. I feel like it's a question I'll let other people answer for uh -huh. me. Um, I have seen Darktown in some Southern literature sections of bookstores, but um, at the same time, Southern literature, like Southern writer and sometimes like Southerner, sometimes it's a label that just gets applied to a certain type of white story. Mm -hmm. So I bet there's plenty of bookstores that have a Southern lit bookstore and w or bookshelf and wouldn't think to put Darktown there. But getting back to the whole labels thing, I try not to put labels on myself. If I had mm -hmm. to put a label on myself, it'd be that I'm an American writer because mm -hmm. all of my books have dealt with certain political social issues that I find to be integral to what makes this country what it is. And the second book was about the myth of the self-made man and the American dream and in times of financial insecurity. It was about the Great Depression, but I think it still resonates with the, the recession that we just went through. The first book was about the, the constant dilemma between individual rights and the safety of the, of the community at large. The third book was sort of a, a Post, or my third book was like a post 9 11 book about you know, terrorism and the role of dissent, and how at that time, especially living in DC, it felt like there was a big crackdown on any kind of dissent. So I just I like picking at these threads of what we find to be you know, important threads in the American tapestry or important aspects of the American story and, and kind of interrogate why they are and what they mean and the different debates that we have about them through time and how they evolve. And I guess to get back to the first question, what, what have I not talked about? I, I can't remember because I get asked a lot of questions. I don't always remember the ones that I've been asked tonight versus other ones. But you asked you what kind of writer I am. You know, my other books dabbled in genre, but with this one, I was like, okay, this is a crime story. Like, I'm not going to overthink the genre thing because I did overthink it when I was younger. Again, like, writers breaking in, they want to be taken seriously. They want to be seen as a literary novelist and not a thriller writer because that's supposedly less artistic. Um, and so, you know, I dabbled with the genre, but I always wanted to make sure I was considered literary fiction. Whereas with this book, I was like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm done worrying about it. This is a story about cops. There's a murder. It's, it's a crime novel. It's a murder mystery. And I'm okay with that because I think any genre, any kind of storytelling done well will be artistic and can resonate. Like, sure, there are some bad airport thrillers that you read on the plane and forget when you land, but there's also some bad literary novels that you forget about after you finish them. So I think the crime novel has a lot of potential. And I read an interview recently with one of my favorite writers, his name is Jonathan Lethem, and he's written very different types of books, but maybe three of his books have been modeled after the kind of classic Raymond Chandler hard-boiled detective story. So he's promoting his new book, which is another mystery. And he said, to me, you know, the hard-boiled detective story has always felt like a sonnet. I was like, oh, I love that, because I see what he means. Like, a sonnet is very rigid. There's a certain structure, a certain number of lines and syllables that you can't break. But within that very rigid form, you can experiment and do so many different things. And so within you know, the formula of there's a murder mystery, there's a body, there's a detective, or some sort of person looking into it, within that, you can do a lot. And, and I tried with Darktown to, to tell a police murder mystery in a new way, you know, by, by dramatizing what these eight men had to do, how they were cops with an arm tied behind their back, and how you know, a lot of the scenes that a murder mystery writer would think, OK, they're going to go interview this person. They're going to go follow this person. Like, well, no, they can't interview that person because they're not allowed in that part of town. 
well, they can't follow this person because they're going to stand out because that person's white and they're black and they're going to notice a black person's driving in the neighborhood. You know, they would call the records department to pull a file on a suspect, but the records lady who's white says, you know, screw you and hangs up on them. So you know, all the this expected scenes couldn't be done or had to be done differently. And uh, to me, that made it fun and made me want to try this project. Well, I can say, having read Dark Town and Lightning Men and waiting on number three, <laughs> that I conclude that you are a really interesting storyteller. Thank you. And that what you do in also interesting ways is cross boundaries while still telling a good story. And that you create for us a world in which we stand and learn some things. Well, thank you. And for us here in this city, we learn some things about the city of Atlanta that we really should have known already, but didn't. And so we're very grateful uh, for you and your eye, your imagination, your, your uh, willingness to take a chance and do thank something you. that's not cookie cutter. I appreciate it. Yeah. So with that, I open it up to the audience. Uh, you got it. <laughs> Good evening. Oh, we actually have a mic right Oh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cynthia, and I am a member of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Less than seven days. <laughs> so I'm very new. However, hi, Thomas. Hi, hi Jacqueline. Hi. I know Charles. I'm showing off my, my people I've met. Alice. Susan, Jill, Jill, Lewis, and Michael's over there. So I've worked the room a little bit. I want to ask you this question, Thomas, about your character management approach. Because of all the layers and complexities, do they get a day where Dunlow is Tuesday, Rex is Thursday, or do you, like most creative people, get that thing in the middle of the morning and you have to get up and add that texture to the character that you've already been working on? Yeah. And are they in a box and you pull it out or are they in a, in a, in a binder? And I'm really big on organization, so I really do sure. need those questions. Sure. No, they're definitely not in a box or a binder. I'm, I'm pretty organized as writers, certainly as writers and other artists go. I mean, God love them, sometimes they're a little scattershot. Um, I'm pretty, pretty disciplined. Um, I'm an outliner, but I'm not like a crazy thorough outliner. Some people won't start until they have like a 10 page outline complete with dialogue and backstories. I don't go that far because I found I, I start with an outline, but then I go and decide, oh, that's that thing that I thought was going to take 10 pages took 50 or vice versa. Um, and so with the characters, all of my books have followed multiple protagonists and I kind of would love to not do that one day because it is really hard. Um, I, one of these days I want to write a book that just follows one person the whole way. Um, I'm sure there's challenges there too, making it interesting or keeping it interesting. But I like shifting and getting those different viewpoints. Um, but you know, days of the week, it's hard in, in terms of the days of the week and the story. It's hard to keep them all together. Like, oh, I had Dunlo do this at night, and now that means that Boggs has got to do this thing during the day. But I, it gets hard. I do a ton of copying and pasting. I move things around. Sometimes I might think it's good, but then I realized, oh wait, I've got 50 pages without Smith. I can't have 50, I gotta, how do I bring him in there? So it's a constant juggling match. Um, in terms of like when I wake up in the morning, what am I gonna do? I go more or less chronologically, but again with a caveat being that like what starts chronologically later gets reshuffled and redone. And there's certain chapters that I'm like particularly psyched to write, and there's some that I'm like, oh man, how am I gonna do this? And my advice to aspiring authors sometimes is like, Skip the hard one. If you don't know how to do the hard job, skip it for now. Get back to it later. So sometimes I do that. I'm like, I don't know how to write this scene, but I don't want to stare at my screen and like bang my head against the keyboard all day. So I'll go to the next scene and then maybe go on for a walk or taking a shower one day. I'll remember. Uh, and I've got a good idea for how to. Like just today, I skipped a section of something I'm working on because I don't know what to do. So they don't get a day, but I, I do try to be from you know the beginning to end. It's messy. Yeah. The birth is it's a very messy birth. That was the question next to you. Um, so Tom, I wanted to ask you 
um, the the white supervisor of Boggs and Smith. Why didn't you choose some you know racist police guy who I mean not that he wasn't you know he was he's like rake straw he's a bit more progressive. Um, he got bullied by the you know by the the department the police department kind of because he stood up for what he thought was wrong and um, so I just wanted to ask you about that character why you chose sure. him. Yeah, thank you for bringing him up. I, f I forgot to mention him. So so Sergeant McGinnis is the white sergeant of the black cops. So again, you've got this precinct in the basement of the Butler Street YMCA with eight rookie cops, all of them black, but they've got a white sergeant. Uh, in real life, his name is Bevo Brooks. And um, the, the black cop spoke well of him. You know, years later, doing, in, there were some uh, AJC articles, and I, I found some other things that they said. They didn't say much in the 40s and 50s. I, when I did my research, going through archives of the Atlanta Daily World and the Constitution and the Journal, I couldn't find much from uh, the cop's perspective back then, because I think they didn't want to rock the boat. They'd probably been warned, don't talk to the press, don't say anything. So whenever I could find a quote, it was like, happy to be here, it's a great honor. Yet like, like, like an athlete being really boring after a game, like, oh, <laughs> happy we won the game, it's just one game at a time. Um, but then in the 80s and 90s, there were retrospective stories about them, and they spoke much more honestly. That's where I got a lot of the more interesting details about the ways they were mistreated by their white colleagues. But they spoke well of Brooks, and they said, you know, we weren't sure what to make of him at first, but you know, we won him over, and he fought some battles for us. And I thought that was really interesting. And I found somewhere, I can't remember where, maybe Herbert Jenkins' memoir, he said that he chose Brooks because he felt that he was not racist, and he had been raised on a relatively integrated street, of which there were some back then. Um, but I don't know if that's true or not. So I'm trying to and trying to figure out who should this character be. I, mean, I liked the idea, of, he's a bit of a cipher for most of the book. You don't really know what to make of him, and, and the, the black rookies don't know what to make of him. He's, he's very by the book and stern, and you, he's got eight rookies. He's probably one of the only sergeants of the police force who has eight rookies, let alone you know, race. But also, he's the only white guy in this black precinct, in this black part of town. I think most white people today would feel uncomfortable being the only white person in an office and in a neighborhood. Certainly back then, I'm sure it was even yet more challenging. So I just thought that was really fascinating that he did that and he eventually did it well. So I deliberately leave McGinnis a little bit mysterious in the book because you know, they're a little wary of him. He's their boss. They don't trust him because he's white, but he's their supervisor, so they have to trust him at least a little bit. Um, and you learn more about why he got the job at the end of the book. And he's still a little mysterious in the second book, but actually my plan for the third book is that he takes on a prime role. Um, I, I wanted to get more into his story. And also with Rake Straw, the white cop, and Box and Smith, I felt it would be unrealistic for them to always be on these cases together. So Rake Straw is going to kind of exit in the third book. He's not really in it. Um, and, and McGinnis sort of becomes like the, the white voice of the book. Because I think he's a really interesting character. And I, I left him deliberately mysterious in the first two, but I want to kind of roll up my sleeves and dig into him for the third book. Yes. <laughs> Put all the questions together. Hi, I'm Susan Grant, and I'm a big fan of both books and, and like you, a transplant. I'm fascinated by the fact that you're here in Atlanta and you want to write an Atlanta book and that the research you're doing seems to be not from having talked to people. It seems to be like book research. Um, so ha and, and there are still people left in, um, who are either of the time or very shortly thereafter who are living here in Atlanta. So now that you're here and you've been here 10 years and it sounds like you're going to stay here and you're an Atlantan, which is, you know, you're kind of on the cusp of being an Atlantan, have you given any thought to digging in deep in a sort of um, human relationship way to really hear the stories from people who were um, living in the places because you, you have a sense of place, you get the mm -hmm. streets, we get a sense of the feeling of, of what Atlanta must have been like and it sure. feels like you could go, you could give us a little bit more if you were, were of it and is that, it, do you stop yourself from doing that or is it just not how you do research is probably the question somewhere in there. Yeah, I guess if I understand what you're asking, I've mostly, I've, I've restricted myself to fiction at this point. When I first got the idea for this, I did think, is this a nonfiction book? Is it a magazine article? Like, I wasn't sure what I had. And when I started doing the research, I thought maybe I'll uncover some amazing crime of the century or trial of the century that they were involved in and write like, you know, a garden of good and evil sort of book for Atlanta, what that one was for Savannah. Um, 
I mean, I did talk to some people who had direct experience, but you know, the original eight have all passed away. And you know, I didn't do as much of that. I've done more of it since, because now that the book is out, I get people coming up to me, and it's easier. I mean, the t it's harder to do that kind of work. It's more time consuming. And at the time, I, I had another job, and I wrote this book. A lot of this book was written on Sunday nights. But you know, I do a ton of research. I, you know, I let the historians and the journalists do that. And then I read their work, and then I, I use that as fuel. So I don't do as much of that pounding the pavement, interviewing stuff, but I've been doing it more now. And certainly, if, if I was writing more contemporary fiction, I would definitely do that. Um, and you know, I have certain some ideas for other manuscripts that would be set now. And then it's more important, because those people are here. Um, whereas, like you were saying, it's harder to find voices from, certainly from 1948. Um, so I, I'm trying to do more of that. Well, we're almost out of time, but I feel obligated now to uh, ask you uh, with that question especially about interviewing what reception have you gotten from the Atlanta black community if any I've, I've gotten I think a good reception I mean mm -hmm. I it depends on what when people say like the black community it's a mm -hmm. it's a large and, and diverse well you demonstrate in the book that it's not as monolithic yeah. as people think so I, I've I've been very fortunate I've received good reviews and I've been at some book clubs and gotten emails and I haven't I haven't heard any pushback. Maybe there are people that don't like it and haven't told me, but I haven't. Well, we are very southern about that. <laughs> but that's true. But All those sometimes nice we tell you when there are things that we really are annoyed by, sure. and you haven't gotten any of that kind of feedback. No, I got more of that with my first book in Washington State, telling me I got some things wrong, yeah. and with my second book telling me I got some things wrong about guns. Um, I, I have not. Um, yeah. I've been. Like I said, I, I guess I've been fortunate. I mean, I, I worked really hard to try to get it right. So, you know, I wanted all the characters to feel real and three-dimensional and nuanced and have their good sides, but also their human flaws. And so I haven't gotten that, hey, who the hell do you think you are kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think, well, I hope that anyone who reads the book will you know, feel that that comment isn't necessary. So the last word I want to use uh, to thank you for what you've done is respect because I think that your two books demonstrate that you have a respect for the characters and the world that you created as a fictional world that's tied to a reality that you are now a part of. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can call you Southern. I mean, Rhode Island is pretty far up there. And you spent all that time. Well, What's the statute of limitations? You've got a few years to go. Uh -huh. I've been in the South since 2000. Oh, oh well, definitely not Southern. That's not enough time. <laughs> yeah, but we are glad that you're here. You are here, and I would ask you to join me in thanking him for a delightful <laughs> Thank you very much. And so now, as I think the plan is, we will sell books, we will sign wait, books. Wait. Before we do, ah. I get the last word. All right. I want to thank both of y'all. Um, <laughs> that's Southern for the two of you. Yes, um, I get it. You, you get that. Yeah. Um, I thought this was great, didn't you? I, I, mean, I, I, I enjoyed the books when I read them. I enjoyed them more hearing a professor of English communications and what's the other thing you do? I'm a rhetorical studies, Charles. And rhetorical <laughs> studies professor quiz the author about the book. That was, I mean, this was fabulous, wasn't it? Jackie, you're tremendous. <laughs> Thank you. That was just great. And, and, and I got a feeling that Tom had never quite gotten some of those questions before. I, I think it's the first time a dean has questioned. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, this, this was just great. And I, I want to make the point, I mean, this is the World Affairs Council, and here we are talking about a book set in Atlanta in 1948. And Keith Valentine, my good friend over here, kept saying, now, Tell me again what this has to do about with international relations, right? Do you, I hope. 
I've got an we answer can, for can, that. You, I know you have an yeah. answer, and I was going to ask you the question. So what's the answer? Let's hear it. Well, I start with the fact that I'm dean of the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts, and it's named after Ivan Allen, Jr., who was mayor of this city, and he was smart enough to know that there was a connection between local and global and that he committed himself as major, mayor to making sure that Atlanta had that global sensibility even though it was righteously what it was as a local place. So it's that connectivity, I believe, that the World Affairs Council can provide in a city like that, this to keep reminding us that the global and the local are always interconnected. That's terrific. I would add one point, okay. Dean, and that is that racism is unfortunately a global issue. A global issue. affair. It yes. really is. And talking about racism in the United States and in Atlanta and in 1948 mm -hmm. helps us understand that when we're busy pointing our fingers at other people that, that we need to look in the mirror a little bit as well. And as I was saying earlier today, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And we have to be vigilant about what we want that difference to be. We have the perfect gifts for y'all tonight. I mean, literally perfect gifts. Since you are both writers, what could be better than notebooks? And not just any notebook. I bet Jennifer McCoy can guess what kind of notebook this is, Jennifer. It's a World Affairs, it's a World Affairs Council <laughs> notebook. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. And so as you are working on your next book, and as you're working on your next book or chapter in a book, it sounds like that's what you're mainly writing. Or a these report at Georgia Tech. Or Georgia Tech. <laughs> And you're walking through Piedmont Park, you're walking through wherever it is, and you get the inspiration, and you need to jot something down. Here it is. It's a nice it, 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 here, here it is. So I want to thank you once again. I want to thank all of y'all. I want to remind you, Alice is going to stand up. Alice, stand up without food in her mouth. And Alice is our membership manager. And those of you who are not members, please join the World Affairs Council. And if you join tonight only, you'll get a really cool deal. And that is you'll get a copy of Darktown that you can have autographed by the author. And, like and you can get a book review written in the back by the dean. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. And, and so, I mean, how, how cool is that? We've also got a couple of upcoming programs I want to tell you all about real, real quickly, okay? Because we've got a whole bunch of stuff coming I mean, this month. Uh, we've got next week on October 9th, Tuesday, it's Tuesday, right? Yeah. Tuesday, October 9th, we've got, um, a, it's called the Chinatown Hall with Condoleezza Rice. Now, she's not actually coming to Atlanta. It's a webcast with Condoleezza Rice, live webcast. Then we've got a China expert in person. It's going to be at UPS headquarters in Sandy Springs. It's going to be great, very cool. The next morning, we have a program, Latinas on the Rise, which Mari Andrade has organized. Wave your hand, Mari. It's going to be at the Center for Civil and Human Rights. It's going to be really cool. You don't have to be Latina to go. You can be any. You can be a Latina, of course, but you can be anything else. Those of us who work with Latinas, who have colleagues who are Latinas, who supervise Latinas, or who are just interested, because the same issues that women face in the workforce everywhere, Latinas face in the workforce, but obviously with a special twist to it. That, get that right? Yeah. Very good. Cool. Uh, it's gonna, and it's going to be great. We got October 17th at the Commerce Club. Uh, David Abney, the CEO of UPS, is going to be talking about rebooting global trade. Can we just rename all of our trade agreements and everybody will like them? <clears throat> That's what we did with NAFTA. Um, 
October 26, uh, we've got a terrific if, program on expanding business opportunities in Korea, how to do business in Korea. It's going to be very cool. It's going to be the Buckhead Club. November 1, we've got a program, Food Waste in a Food Insecure World. Um, it's organized by our young leaders, our under 40 members, but it's not just, you don't, you can be over 40, they'll even let me in, you can go. It's going to be great, and it's going to be at the Atlanta <coughs> Community Food Bank, which is, somebody will tell you, I, mean, I, can't, I can't describe how to get there from here, but it's on your GPS, I've been there before, it's great, it's a, it's a cool opportunity. Join the World Affairs Council, come to our programs, thank you again, Tom, you were great, Jackie, you were fabulous. This was a great evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Tom's going to sign books right now. Now I see the number of y'all have books sitting in front of you. So you you'll get to work. All right. Thank okay, you, good. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.